Hello and welcome everyone. So in this video, we are going to study the serializability from transactions and from the book Designing Data Intensive Applications. So let's begin. In the previous sections of this chapter, we have seen various race conditions like lost update, write skews and phantoms. And the solution to all these problems is serializable isolation. So serializable isolation is usually regarded as the strongest isolation level and it guarantees that even though the transactions may execute in parallel, the end result is same as if they has been executed one at a time serially without any concurrency. And right now there are three ways of serializability, actual, seriali ac actual serial execution, two-phase locking and serializable snapshot isolation. So we will look at one of them in this video. So let's first look at the actual serial execution. So what is the easiest way to solve the concurrency problems? So the easiest way is to remove the concurrency at all. Basically to execute only one transaction in a time in a serial order on a single thread. But in the past we have identified that multi-threaded execution is used for getting the good performance. But then why we are suggesting now to move to a single threaded execution? So let's see the main two reasons behind to move to a single threaded execution. The first one is that RAM has become cheap over the time and it has become feasible to keep the entire data set in the memory. So when all the data that a transaction requires when, and when the data is present in memory, it becomes much faster for a transaction to execute and than if the data would have been present in the disk. So it, much time would take if the data would have been loaded from the disk. And second is that database designers realize that OLTP transactions are usually short and they take only a small number of reads and writes. Whereas long running analytic queries are generally read only transactions and they can run on the consistent snapshot isolation. But with the serial execution, the throughput is limited to that of a single CPU core because now we are utilizing only a single thread and there is no concurrency at all. So we just saw that if we execute the transaction serially, it makes the concurrency control a lot simpler. But there is a limitation that the transaction throughput depends upon the speed of a single CPU core on a single machine. So this works fine when we are using read only transactions, for example, in analytic queries. So there we can run the transaction with a consistent snapshot isolation. But with the applications where we require a high write throughput, the single threaded transaction can become a serious bottleneck. So how can we scale those transactions? So in that case, we can partition the, the data and each CPU core can be allocated to one partition. So in this way, we can scale linearly with the number of CPU cores. But with the transactions that needs to access multiple partitions, the database must coordinate the transactions across all the partition that it touches. But with the transactions that needs to query only in a single partition, it is much easier. So the cross partition transactions have additional coordination overhead and are generally slower than the single partition transactions. But how the data partitioning depends. So whether the transactions can be a single partition or a cross partition, it depends how your data is structured and how it is used by the application. So the databases and the data with multiple secondary indexes requ require a lot of cross partition coordination and sometimes the performance degrades. So let's summarize how the serial execution works. So let's see what are the constraints of a serial execution. So every transaction must be small and fast. Why? Because it executes on a single thread and if the transaction takes a lot of time to process, then it can slow down the system and it can block the other transactions. The second constraint is that it is limited to the use cases where the active data set can fit in the memory. But if the transaction requires the data to be accessed from the disk, then it can take a lot of time to process and it can slow down the system. Also, these kind of transactions require a less write throughput because it has to be executed on a single CPU core. But if the transactions with serial execution wants to have a high write throughput, then it needs to be partitioned without requiring the cross partition coordination because there is a lot of overhead in the cross partition transactions and even the cross partition transactions are possible but there is a hard limit to the extent that they can be used. 
Now let's see how the two-phase locking is used and what is actually a two-phase locking. In the previous section, we have seen how locks are used to prevent the dirty writes. That is, if two transactions concurrently try to write to the same object, then the lock ensures that the second writer must wait until the first one has finished the transaction. So two-phase locking is similar, but it makes the lock requirements much stronger. So several transactions are allowed to concurrently read the same object as long as nobody is writing to it. But as soon as anyone wants to write to the object, exclusive access is required. So let's see if transaction A has read an object and transaction B wants to write to the same transaction, then B must wait until A has finished reading the transaction, reading the object and it completes the transaction. Similarly, if A transaction has written an object and transaction B wants to read that object, then B must wait until A commits or aborts. So in two-phase locking, writers block the other writers as well as the readers and readers block the writers. Whereas in snapshot isolation, readers never block the writers and writers never block the readers. So let's see the implementation of two-phase locking. So blocking of readers and writers is implemented by having a lock on each object in the database. So the lock can be either in a shared mode or in an exclusive mode. So the lock can be used in following ways. So if a transaction wants to read an object, it must first acquire the lock in a shared mode. And several transactions are allowed to hold the lock in a shared mode simultaneously but if another transaction already has an exclusive lock on the object, then a transaction must wait. Also, if a transaction wants to write an object, it must first acquire the lock in exclusive mode and no other transaction can hold the lock at the same time. So if there is any existing lock on the object, then the transaction must also wait. And if a transaction first reads and then writes an object, then it may upgrade it shared lock to an exclusive lock. Also, a trans if a transaction has acquired the lock, then it must continue to hold the lock until the end of the transaction. And that is why it is also named as two phase because the first phase is when the locks are acquired and the second phase is when the all the locks are released. And since so many locks are in use, it can happen that transaction A is stuck waiting for the transaction B to release its lock and transaction B is stuck for the transaction A to release, release its lock and this situation is called a deadlock and some databases automatically detects the deadlock between the transactions and it aborts one of them so that the others can make progress. So the aborted transaction needs to be retried by the application. Now let's see what are predicate locks. So in the previous sections we have seen the problem of phantoms that is one transaction changing the results of another transaction's search query. In the previous sections, we have discussed the meeting room booking example where two people simultaneously search for the available meeting rooms and they happen to book the same meeting room at the same time. But what should have happened ideally? The ideal case is that if one transaction has searched for an existing bookings for a room within a certain time window, then Another transaction is not allowed to concurrently insert or update another booking for the same room and for the same time. So how can we implement this? Conceptually, we need a predicate lock. So it works similarly to the shared and exclusive lock as we described earlier, but rather predicate lock belonging to a particular object, it belongs to all the objects that match some search condition such that in the example that what are the available rooms at this particular time. So but predicate lock has some restrictions and let's see what are those restrictions. So if a transaction wants to read some objects matching some condition like in the select query we fire uh, while searching for a meeting room that search for the available rooms in this particular time then it must acquire a shared mode predicate lock on the conditions of the query. So if another transaction be currently has an exclusive lock on any object that matches those conditions, then A must wait until B releases its lock before it is allowed to make its query. Also, if a transaction wants to insert, update or delete an object, 
it must first check whether either the old or the new value matches any existing predicate lock and if there is a matching predicate lock held by the transaction b then a must wait until b has either committed or aborted before it can continue so the key idea here is that predicate lock applies to even those objects that do not yet exist in the database but which might be added in the future that is phantoms so if two phase locking includes the predicate locks the database will prevent all forms of write queues and other race conditions and so this isolation becomes serializable so now let's understand serializable snapshot isolation so in this chapter we have seen a lot of concurrency controls like two phase locking which does not provide a good performance serial execution which does not scale well also we have seen a lot of other weak isolation levels which provides a lot of race conditions like lost updates write queues and phantoms so to overcome all these problems serializable snapshot isolation has been very promising so it provides full serializability but has only a small performance penalty as compared to the snapshot isolation so let's see the difference between various snapshot isolations and how the serializable snapshot isolation overcomes those problems so two phase locking is also called pessimistic concurrency control and it is based on the principle that if anything might go wrong and it's better to wait until the situation is safe again before doing anything so it is like mutual exclusion which is used to protect the data structures in multi threaded programming whereas serial execution is pessimistic to the extreme that it is equivalent to each transaction having an exclusive lock on the entire on the entire database for the duration of the transaction so we compensate for the pessimism by making each transaction very fast to execute so that it only needs to hold the lock for a short time because it is running on a single threaded cpu now whereas a uh, serializable snapshot isolation is an optimistic control technique optimistic in the context that it means instead of blocking if something potentially dangerous happens transactions continue anyway in the hope that everything will turn out all right and when a transaction wants to commit then the database checks whether anything had happened bad and if so the transaction aborts and has to be retried so only transactions that executed serializably are allowed to commit but it performs badly if there is a high contention as many transactions try to access the same object and this leads to a high proportion of transactions needing to abort so if the system is already close to its maximum throughput the additional transaction load from the retried transactions can make the performance worse so as the name already suggests that serializable snapshot isolation is based on snapshot isolation that is all the reads within a transaction are made from the consistent snapshot of the database also it adds an algorithm for detecting the serialization conflicts among the writes and determining which transactions to abort now let's see how the decisions are based on the outdated premise in the previous sections we have discussed about write skew in snapshot isolation and we observed a pattern the pattern was that a transaction reads some data from the database examines the result of the query and decides to take some action based on the result set of the query for example in the doctors on call example where two doctors were on call at some time and they decided to go both off call at the same time so the database queried that what are the available doctors on on call at the same time and it results the uh, and it gives the uh, result as two and hence based on this action that there are two doctors the query was executed so under snapshot isolation the result from the original query may no longer be up to date by the time the transaction commits because the data may have been modified in the meantime so we put it another way the transaction is taking an action based on a premise and the, that premise can change at a later time so when the transaction wants to commit the original data may have changed that is the premise may no longer be true so when the application makes a query for example the doctor is on call 
the database does not know how that application logic is being used by the result of the query so to be safe the database needs to assume that any change in the query result means that writes in the transaction may be invalid in other words there can be a casual dependency between the queries and writes in the transaction and in order to provide serializable isolation the database must detect the situations in which a transaction may have acted on an outdated premise and about the transaction in that case so what are the ways to identify that the decision has been based on an outdated premise so there are two ways that is detecting the reads of a stale mvcc object version and detecting the writes that affect the prior reads so let's see one by one let's first see how the detection of stale mvcc reads work so snapshot isolation is usually implemented by multi version concurrency control and if you want to know more about the snapshot isolation please refer to my previous video the link is in the description section below so when the transaction reads from a consistent snapshot in an mvcc database it ignores the writes that were made by any other transaction that hadn't been yet committed at the time when the snapshot was taken let's take the doctors off call example so let's assume that alice and bob are two doctors on call at some time t1 then at time t2 alice decides to go off call and makes a write transaction but at time t3 bob also decides to off call go off call because the premise is still holding that two doctors are on call and alice at time t2 transaction has not yet committed but at time t4 alice commits and then at time t5 bob commits so if we see that the premise which bob was assuming that two doctors are on call is wrong so in order to prevent this anomaly the database needs to track when a transaction ignores another transaction writes due to the mvcc visibility rules so when the transaction wants to commit the database checks whether any of the ignored writes have now been committed and if so the transaction must be aborted now let's see how the detecting writes that affect the prior reads work so the second case to consider is that when another transaction modifies the data after it has been read so let's take alice and bob example that they both are on call during the shift 1 2 3 4 and if there is an index on the shift id the database can use the index entry 1 2 3 4 to record the fact that the transactions t1 and t2 has and t3 has read this data so this information only needs to be kept for a while and after the transaction has finished and all the concurrent transactions have finished the database can forget that what data it has read so when a transaction writes to the database it must look in the indexes for any other transactions that have recently read the affected data and this process is similar to acquiring a write lock on the affected key range but rather than blocking until the readers have committed the lock acts as a trip wire that is it simply notifies the transactions that the data may no longer be up to date so in our example t2 uh, at time t2 alice decides to go off call at t3 bob decides to go off call and at time t4 alice decides to commit the transaction so at time t4 the uh, alice can communicate to the uh, to bob that this has the premise has changed so now let's see the performance of serializable snapshot isolation so compared to two phase locking the big advantage of serializable snapshot isolation is that one transaction does not need to block waiting for locks held by another transaction so like snapshot isolation writers don't block the readers and readers don't block the writers also its performance is not limited to the throughput of a single cpu core like the serial execution and the third point is that the transaction that reads or writes data over a long period of time is likely to run into conflicts and aborts so serializable snapshot isolation requires that read and writes transaction should be short so now let's summarize what we have studied in this chapter and in this video so we have seen what is serializability and how it overcomes various concurrency problems we have seen three ways of serializability that is actual serial execution two phase locking and serializable snapshot isolation 
and we have seen their implementation and their advantages over each other so i hope you like the content and have a better understanding of how the transactions work and what are the various concurrency control methods that can be used within a transaction and you must have understood by now that what are the advantages and disadvantages of one concurrency control method over the other and what are their use cases so please share with your friends and colleagues to have more understanding and keep learning thank you